Thank you very much for being here and welcome to the last EU in Focus talk. Today we are going to discuss about migration crisis, which is probably one of the most important topics at stake uh, at the EU level and also at the national level uh, at this moment. So we are going to discuss how the EU deals with this, with this issue, what are the rules behind the management of the big flux of migrants who are arriving to Europe. And uh, we're going to discuss this with uh, uh, Lilian Surdi. Thank you very much for being here. Lilian is a Max Weber Fellow at the uh, Law Department of the European University Institute here in Fiesole. She is a module convener and tutor at the School of Advanced Studies of the University of London and a visiting lecturer at the Université Libre de Bruxelles in Brussels. She has a, an experience dealing with, uh, with this issue and in particular with the, uh, you know, the, the laws that are behind the migration crisis. So I leave the floor to Lilian and thank you very much again for being here. Thank you very much, Michael, for the kind introduction and the kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you and uh, I hope we will have the opportunity to talk more also about your... I know that many of you are undertaking individual projects on migration issues, so I'd like to hear also about the work that you are undertaking. So my research, my doctoral thesis focused on the European asylum policy and on an aspect that is not so much looked at, the aspect of the implementation of the rules. And so I have a kind of challenging proposition of whether what is called the Europe's migration crisis is in fact a migration or a governance crisis. But this is something that we will see bit by bit together. I'd like to start with, with some context, with uh, a short video. It refers... In the summer of 2015, Europe experienced the highest influx of refugees since the Second World War. Why? The main reason is that Syria has become the world's top source of refugees. Syria is located in the Middle East, an ancient fertile land settled for at least 10,000 years. Since the 1960s, it's been led by the Al-Assad family, who have ruled it as quasi-dictators until the Arab Spring happened in 2011. A revolutionary wave, protests and conflicts in the Arab world that toppled many authoritarian regimes. But the Assads refused to step down and started a brutal civil war. Different ethnicities and religious groups fought each other in changing coalitions. ISIS, a militaristic jihadist group, used the opportunity and entered the chaos with the goal to build a totalitarian Islamic caliphate. Very quickly, it became one of the most violent and successful extremist organizations on earth. All sides committed horrible war crimes using chemical weapons, mass executions, torture on a large scale, and repeated deadly attacks on civilians. The Syrian population was trapped between the regime, rebel groups, and religious extremists. A third of the Syrian people have been displaced within Syria, while over 4 million have fled the country. The vast majority of them reside now in camps in the neighboring countries who are taking care of 95% of the refugees, while the Arab states of the Persian Gulf together have accepted zero Syrian refugees, which has been called especially shameful by Amnesty International. The UN and the World Food Program were not prepared for a refugee crisis on this scale. As a result, many refugee camps are crowded and undersupplied, subjecting people to cold, hunger and disease. The Syrians lost hope that their situation will be getting better anytime soon, so many decided to seek asylum in Europe. Between 2007 and 2014, the European Union had invested about 2 billion euros in defenses, high-tech security technology and border patrols, but not a lot in preparation for an influx of refugees. So it was badly prepared for the storm of asylum seekers. In the EU, a refugee has to stay in the state they arrived in first, which put enormous pressure on the border states that were already in trouble. Greece, in the midst of an economic crisis on the scale of the Great Depression, was not able to take care of so many people at once, leading to terrible scenes of desperate, hungry people on islands usually reserved for tourists. The world needed to come together and act as a united front, but instead, it has become more divided. Many states downright refused to take in any refugees, leaving the border states alone in their struggle. In 2014, the UK voted to stop a huge search and rescue operation called Mare Nostrum that was designed to stop asylum seekers from drowning in the Mediterranean. The idea seems to have been that a higher death toll on the sea would mean fewer asylum seekers trying to make the journey, but of course, in reality, that's not what happened. 
The perception of the crisis around the world suddenly changed when photos circulated of a dead boy from Syria found lying face down on a beach in Turkey. Germany announced that it will without exception accept all Syrian refugees and is now preparing to take in 800,000 people in 2015. More than the entire EU took in 2014, only to impose temporary border controls a few days later and demand an EU-wide solution. All over the West, more and more people are beginning to take action, although support for asylum seekers has mostly come from citizens, not from politicians. But so this was just to give a background. We, it was, of course, many notions and also pieces of, of legislation and facts, so we will come back to this, but I thought it portrayed in a kind of concise way some of the main challenges that we have seen. I also wanted to show you some numbers before we start going into maybe the nitty-gritty uh, of the law. So this was also raised in the video. In fact, although we are talking about a migration crisis in Europe, you will see that out of the now near 5 million uh, Syrian refugees, the majority of them have actually found asylum protection in countries in the region. So you saw Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon. Turkey alone hosts close to 3 million refugees. So it is good to keep these numbers in mind when we are talking about what constitutes a crisis for the EU, which in fact is 28 uh, member states, some of which are the strongest economies uh, in the world. Mainly those arriving came by sea, so making uh, the trip from Turkey to Greece or from North Africa to Italy. And you can see the numbers. These were more high, close to a million in 2015, and they have dropped in 2016. We will discuss about the EU-Turkey deal and the consequences that this has brought about. And just to say that on a human level, there is, of course, a very high death toll because there are, we will see, very few legal ways for uh, protection seekers to reach the EU. So many of them are actually smuggled, arrive irregularly, and these are dangerous routes in unseaworthy boats. And so we see these are, of course, there cannot be exact numbers because many of the deaths are undocumented, but IOM recently started a project called Missing Migrants, where they are really trying to document through uh, the press and through whatever information they can find on the state level, uh, how many migrants are losing their life on the way. And we see that the documented numbers were 5,000 in 2016, and already in the first months uh, of 2017, close to 500 persons. So quite a high death toll. This, as we are speaking about a crisis and a peak uh, in the arrivals, so this has been translated also into a peak in asylum applications. And here the graph shows, in fact, from 2005 to 2015, this kind of uh, augment in the uh, increase in the first time asylum applications that reached this peak level in 2015 of 1 million applications. This is EU-wide. And then, so that we don't forget, behind these numbers, actually, we are talking about individuals fleeing very difficult situations in Syria. We are talking about indiscriminate violence, risk of torture, uh, also all, in fact, the consequences of armed conflict, uh, breakdown in any in, of, of the state. Uh, we have ISIS, so we have quite... Uh, let's say, on the human uh, level, fleeing very difficult conditions. So when we are talking about pieces of legislation or policy responses or numbers, it's good to remember who uh, we are, in fact, talking about behind those numbers. And here we see more a policy uh, setting, high-level meetings with the president of the European Commission, Juncker, Angela Merkel and Donald Tusk, who is the president of the European Council in the so-called uh, Bratislava summit. 
So before we move on, because you, you hear a lot of uh, words uh, that are quite technical terms in, 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 in law, so asylum, refugees, which are of course used also very often in the policy and, and journalistic uh, discourse, but I thought that it was necessary, as I am a lawyer, to have a perhaps small pedantic part where we also discuss about the law and, and the meaning of these terms. So thinking about asylum, so what is asylum and, and the right to asylum? By asylum, I mean, to put it very plainly, residence permits on protection grounds. So someone achieving in a particular state the fact to gain residence, the permission to stay legally on the basis uh, of protection grounds. And there is surprisingly no internationally agreed definition. So there is no international convention on asylum. There is an international convention on refugees, as we will see in the slides immediately afterwards. But there is no legally binding text at international level on asylum. This is uh, why I have the definition uh, or the explanation by one of the leading uh, academics of the past century on what, in fact, asylum means. So as we don't have an instrument at international level, this means that it is either regulated at regional level, and here in the EU we have such rules, so the European asylum policy, the common European asylum system. So we have rules applying to all the 28 member states on when they are supposed to give this residence permit on protection grounds, to which people, how and under which procedures. In other places of the world, this would be national regulation. So also Canada, the US, they have national level regulations on who is uh, to have such residence permits. So refugees are the category uh, that are most uh, traditionally linked with asylum and with this permit on protection grounds. But just bear in mind that they are the main category, but they are not the only category of persons that receive asylum. So there is a very particular understanding on who is a refugee, and this is premised, in fact, on a convention at international level. So you might have heard of the Geneva Convention on the status of refugees. So this was adopted in the aftermath of World War II, when we had, in fact, great uh, displacement uh, after uh, the Holocaust. So it was in this uh, framework, so in this historical moment that it was adopted. But after some years, in 1967, and here you see the 1967 protocol, although at the beginning it was supposed to tackle this post-World War II situation of displacement, this limitation was lifted and in fact uh, it is applicable to any, uh, let's say, population, to any individual that, and you see the formal legal definition and some elements in red, because there is a very particular understanding under law who is a refugee. So it is someone, first of all, who have crossed the borders of their country, who are uh, fleeing persecution, and by this you can understand grave human rights violations, uh, for example, when you try to think, so what is persecution? And it is for one of a specific five set of exhaustive reasons. So there has to be a link. So they are persecuted because of the race, religion, nationality, membership of particular uh, social group or political opinion. They are either persecuted for these reasons or they cannot find protection from their state on the basis of these reasons. And this absence of protection is a very important part. So what in fact is refugee protection? It is a kind of surrogate protection when you cannot find for these reasons protection from your state of nationality or habitual residence. You seek this kind of protection from a third country. So you seek 
asylum. So third notion, but it is very important because you might have heard non refoulement the principle of non refoulement which is something quite technical uh, that is being uh, thrown around. So this is linked with human rights instruments and with human rights protection. So we have the prohibition of torture in human or degrading treatment. And this is an absolute prohibition. So no one under any circumstances should not be subjected to torture in human or degrading treatment. And by absolute, I mean, even if we have a terrorist, let's say, and we would like to have a confession or, or to find where is the ticking bomb, we are not allowed to use torture in order to extract this information. So this is what I mean, absolute prohibition. And because of its absolute nature, it is not only that it is forbidden actively, for example, from the authorities of the country to those who find themselves, for example, in the United States, it is also prohibited to return someone in a third country, in another country, so for example, back to Syria, if we know that there they could be subjected to torture in human or degrading treatment. So non refoulement is in fact this non-return part. We are not supposed to return someone to a country where we know that they might face torture in human or degrading treatment. Although in the refugee convention, so on who is a refugee, we have uh, also a set of substantial rights. So once you are found to be a refugee, uh, there are certain social economic rights that come with that. The problem with the prohibition of non refoulement in our human rights instruments is that although this non-return part is clear, there is an absence of a clear framework of rights owed to those who are not to be returned. So we have situation of persons in limbo. Uh, if they are not caught by the refugee definition, because I told you it was quite specific, but then uh, they are not to be returned also. Sometimes they find themselves having a right not to be returned, but not much else. So this is also a problem of articulation between the different legal frameworks. And perhaps this is too much to fathom, but I just wanted for us to have a visual. So when we are talking about Europe's migration crisis, we have legal rules uh, from different levels that come into play. We have, first of all, the international level, and I talked to you about the 1951 Refugee Convention, so we have the obligations from this instrument. We have also our human rights protection regime, and I told you about the non refoulement principle, so non return to torture in human or degrading treatment. Then, to make things more difficult, we have the Council of Europe level, and you might have heard about the Council of Europe, a kind of regional uh, formation with the seat in Strasbourg. You might have heard about the European Convention on Human Rights. So it is a regional instrument of human rights protection. And there too, while we don't have the right to asylum, we have this kind of proclamation of the prohibition of non refoulement So this is the second layer that comes into play. And then we have the third layer, because we have the EU. And I heard that you had already a first introductory, maybe, course on, on the EU, on the institutions. So at EU level, so the 28 member states, we also have another human rights instrument, the EU Charter on Fundamental Rights. And there we have a right to asylum, and we have, again, a proclamation of the prohibition of non refoulement So it's all these legal frameworks that come together uh, all these rights when we are talking about the treatment uh, of and the responses to the migration crisis. So on the international level, that's within the EU, the EU's international level, because there is no international government, right? So it's the international level that the, e that the EU practices on, is that correct? 
So the 1951 Refugee Convention, all member states of the EU are parties to this uh. convention. Uh, so in this sense, they also are uh, obliged to, to follow these rules and this has been taken into account in our treaties. So for example, the EU treaties say the EU must develop an EU asylum policy that must be in accordance with the 1951 Refugee Convention. So knowing that all member states have signed uh, this convention, they said that this must be taken into account when we are developing our own policy. So, for example, uh, the US is B and, and, and C uh, would not apply, but A would apply. So the US is also a, a party to the 1951 Refugee Convention. So all that is happening now with, with the ban, uh, for example, the travel ban and how this affects refugees. This also links uh, with the 1951 Refugee Convention. So you have to think that another national state would have, for example, its international level obligations, the 1951 Refugee Convention, and whatever obligations it had at national level, so your constitution. Whereas in the EU, the member states have the international level, the Council of Europe level, the EU level, and their national constitution. So it's quite complex uh, legal environments that we are operating in. All right, so there's always like, um, for each level, there's always another level of complexity added to this. So uh, my question is, is there, like, could the specific country choose to cherry pick one or do they have to abide by all? They have to abide by all. And in fact, in, in our laws, we take into account very well the other frameworks. So the EU, let's say, which is the third level that, that concerns 28, for now, we also have Brexit underway. So uh, they, our laws, uh, clearly state that the policy uh, must be in compliance with the 1951 Refugee Convention and in compliance with the European Convention on Human Rights. So whenever we are building, we are building upon the existing legal obligations. But of course, this can become on a technical level very difficult once you have a case arriving uh, before the court, which must take into account also the international level. So it must check, okay, we said it should, we will be in compliance with international level, is it? So then the court of justice is called to sometimes check the compatibility of EU law with the 1951 Refugee Convention or with ACHR. So technically for us, it can be very, very, let's say, complex. But this is the environment that we are operating in. So what's the difference between Council of Europe level and the EU level? Mm -hmm. So the Council of Europe level, all the EU member states are part of the Council of Europe, but it is broader. It is Europe uh, if you think more broadly, so you have inside Turkey, uh, you have the countries in the Caucasus, you have Russia, so you have many more countries being part of the Council of Europe than uh, of the EU. So the EU is a more a smaller, more uh, select club, <laughs> if you will. Uh, the Council of Europe is another regional formation where you have many more uh, countries and the links at EU level are stronger. So you have more developed institutions, uh, you have harmonization of laws. In the Council of Europe, we have the European Convention of Human Rights, so a human rights framework, but we don't have such, uh, let's say, high level of, of integration in, in different policies. So you have to think of it as something broader as Europe plus, EU plus. So what this slide is trying to do is to, to pull the gist of what we have done at EU policy level uh, in order to build, so how did we design our EU asylum policy? So I told you that there were several uh, legal rules that we had to take into account. How did we organize this at regional level? First of all, because we hear about the common, a common system, a common European asylum system, 
it's, it's easy that our mind goes to EU level decision making. So a common system means that there is some kind of institution at EU level where people uh, file their applications and, and gives a response that would be valid EU wide. This is not the case. So what in fact we have is a coordination of 28 distinct asylum systems. So what this means is that also what we harmonized was our legislation, so our legal framework, but then every country has to give the resources to make a running system. So <coughs> Italy has to fund, fund <laughs> a, an office uh, that will process uh, the, asi the asylum applications in Italy. It has to fund reception centers where people will be fed and clothed and will be able to stay while they await uh, for the response of their application. And once you have a response, a positive response, it will be valid at national level. What does this mean is that I told you before what is asylum, it is a residence permit on protection grounds. Well, you have a residence permit for Italy on protection grounds. You don't have a residence permit for the EU. You cannot say, I have been recognized as a refugee by Italy, so I go uh, now and live in Germany. This is not possible. So it doesn't mean freedom of movement, freedom then to choose which EU member state you want to stay into. If, however, <laughs> the response is negative, then it has an EU wide validity because the world is not fair as you very well know by now. So this has to do with our responsibility allocation system. So once we started having a common system, one of the ideas behind was that, well, we now have here a, a space where there are no internal borders and maybe uh, you have realized this when you are traveling from one EU member state to another, to those that are part of the so-called uh, Schengen area. So you are not stopped at the border for an individual uh, control. So they said, well, then asylum seekers could also circulate, but we want to avoid the situation where someone goes to France, have their application examined, is rejected, then moves to Germany, has their application examined, then moves to the UK, so that they do a, a little tour. And on the other hand, we want to avoid the ping pong that someone arrives in France and France says, oh, no, 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 not me. And then they go to Germany, oh, no, not me, so that we would have people in orbit. So what did they say? They said, well, we want a system that will actually declare that one member state will be responsible for examining the application. So this is your one chance only principle. And this is, you might have seen in the movie, the so-called Dublin regulation, which is very infamous at EU level. It is a legal instrument that tries to help us through some criteria see, well, which is going to be this one member state that will be responsible. But what happened is that the way uh, that it, this instrument was designed actually has the effect to keep asylum seekers as close to the external borders as possible. Because they said that, well, our criteria are uh, first, well, do you have a family member? Uh, you arrive in Greece, uh, for example, because we also, in our system, we didn't build so many legal ways to arrive in Europe. So we have resettlement, but it is uh, very, very small in terms of numbers, a few thousand. So most of the people, this one million that you saw, they didn't get uh, visas to arrive here. They arrived irregularly. So then you arrive in the first member state where you managed close to the external borders, Italy or Greece. And then you file your application. And before they, they start examining if you are fleeing persecution, uh, let's say, in fact, from Syria, or what was your case, they start examining, well, which is the member state that is responsible to see this application through. And so our system said, well, first rule was, do you have another family member in another EU member state that is either legally resident there or is an asylum seeker already there? 
But when I say family, because your mind could go to uncles and cousins and, and let's say colloquially family can be very uh, large, we are talking about a very strict legal definition where mainly we are talking about the nuclear family. So spouse, children, that's it. Only for unaccompanied minors has this been relaxed and they can be reunited uh, with further members of the family. But you cannot say, oh, I have an uncle there. Or, so it's family very, very uh, strictly legally understood. Then we have the criterion, did a member state uh, give you a visa to come in, which is uh, quite rare, but OK, accounts uh, for a certain number of cases. And then we go to the criterion, well, which was the country where you first entered irregularly. And you understand that in terms of feasibility, the country where you first entered irregularly will be the country that is closest to the region, to the troubled region, to the region of armed conflict. So this has been Greece and Italy. And that's why we saw a lot of people arriving through these two member states. So through our allocation systems, these countries are responsible for guarding the external borders, then for saving people at sea, and of course for allowing those who are asylum seekers to come in. And then they would be responsible for processing their applications, fending for the people during this time, and finally delivering a nationally valid residence permit, meaning that if these one million people who crossed uh, from sea had in fact stayed in Greece, Greece would need it to have uh, seen through all these applications and then suddenly say, I give a residence permit to one million new inhabitants. Quite <coughs> difficult. But this was how the system was conceptualized. It was designed in a very strange way. Many people say fair weather system, so in fact they expected very few numbers of asylum seekers reaching the EU. So how do we, sh we share responsibility? Well, as I told you, uh, the, the Dublin allocates a responsibility, but not fairly. So fairness among EU member states was not a consideration when they are, were creating the system. So this was mainly through legal harmonization. And what do I mean? Because this is a strange notion. So what they wanted to avoid was legislative dumping, like every country saying, I will have the worst rules, and then they will go to the other country, and I will give very few social provisions, and they will go here or there. So they said, no, we have to have a minimum. So in this way, they had sharing, because they said, well, you cannot be as bad as sending, let's say, the people somewhere else, so we will harmonize our rules, so it will be uh, of the same level everywhere. Of course, there is this gap that you can harmonize in law, but then you have to implement in practice. And in practice, the funding in order to implement these rules was supposed to come from the national level. So there was some EU funding, but this was considered, uh, was conceptualized as a kind of top up, as a kind of cherry on the cake. And at best, it covered for about 10% of national expenses. So mainly you were supposed to say, this was my budget, I was going to do, I don't know, help the unemployed, uh, build schools, but now I'm giving this money to asylum seekers. So this was the way also that we conceptualized the financing uh, of the system, whereas one could say that asylum provision is a regional public good for Europe. And people sharing uh, was not conceptualized. As I told you, your residence permit was tied to one member state, and it didn't mean that afterwards you could go to settle somewhere else. This could only uh, happen eventually in very, very few cases where someone managed to have the status of long-term resident, which means five years of legal residence and also uh, fulfilling several financial criteria. So it is very difficult to move uh, as a recognized uh, protection beneficiary from one place to another. 
So how do you see this? What kind of problems uh, do you see emerging from this design of the system? What would you, what, what strikes you when you see how we built our system? With the Dublin system, obviously, the uh, Greece initially would be overloaded with applications, which I guess, which is what led to the Turkey EU deal, but that's what I would foresee. Exactly. This is where we are going next. You are very right. <laughs> I feel like since like the EU funding is so little, it provides a strong incentive for countries to not um, let uh, refugees in because it's going to be like a huge burden on the country's financial system, like like the country's like uh, finance sites. This is another excellent point. So they are supposed to draw from their national budget so they they have every let's say on a policy level you have disincentives for implementation because they say well isn't it best if i stop the people from coming or if i have such poor uh, reception conditions that people will go here and there instead so refugee or, or governance crisis because the the discourse uh, about this being a migrant crisis, a refugee crisis, due only to the high numbers of, of people who have arrived. So you already raised some of these points. So we have a potential for uneven distribution. People uh, would actually concentrate at the external borders. There are not enough measures to offset imbalances. As you said, then the money is supposed to come from the national budget. We have also, if you think the, geographically, the same member states that are at the external border, they're supposed to uh, safeguard uh, the borders of the Union and then uh, provide protection. So you have a mixture of disincentives for implementation and inability to implement, and this has created a, a kind of climate of mutual uh, mistrust among the member states because Greece says, well, I am, I am in a crisis, a uh, financial crisis, I am, it's, I am unable uh, to provide for these people. But then they said, well, yes, but then you had only made uh, less than 1,000, let's say, spaces. Or until 2011, you had assigned just five administrators nationwide to look through the application. So you have a kind of distrust because it is very difficult to see where, let's say, unwillingness stops and where uh, inability starts. And plus, from what I told you, you have several member states that were not touched by asylum issues. So these were the member states that were lucky enough neither to find themselves at the external borders, not to be uh, preferred also by asylum seekers conducting secondary movements, so member states with highly developed, uh, let's say, uh, economic uh, systems uh, like Germany or where you have presence of migrant communities like the UK where people had ties and you want to go. So you had several member states that through this conceptualization were happily unaffected by the system. And we will see how actually they have reacted uh, to the measures later on that actually call for the participation of everyone. So enter the crisis. Here, this was our system, as largely as I described it to you. There had been tensions in the system already before, so we had some important case law coming from our European courts, the one, as I told you, uh, Council of Europe in Strasbourg and the other uh, at EU level in Luxembourg. So about the situation in Greece, so things were already hard before 2011. This is not to say that the crisis started in 2015. But then, of course, we had the increased arrivals of individuals and they uh, arrive in this situation. So unseaworthy boats loaded up with people. Uh, many people die just because they cannot uh, swim or because of the congestion in these boats. So really arriving in horrible situations. So then we had a, a certain number of policy responses. So a drama in five acts. We will see for sure the four acts together. The last one 
uh, the, the reform of the Dublin regulation is sort of blocked also at legislative level. So we will see if there is time and if there is need to discuss about it. So the first one, Schengen, Schengen revolving doors. So you saw also in the video at the beginning that at some point, in fact, Germany, well, realizing uh, the vastly unfair result of the allocation through the Dublin regulation and the fact that suddenly you had one million persons uh, crossing through Greece, well, they said, we stop with the Dublin system and we will accept any uh, individual who is Syrian. So you saw Syrian is okay in the video. So this is when you had, this is what I mean, German open policy without Dublin. So in fact, they said, well, at this moment, and this was around August, September 2015, it was a kind of the good hegemon, uh, if, you, if you wish, hoping that other member states would follow uh, this example. Uh, in fact, they were followed only by Sweden. And the rest were saying, oh, great, free riding. Germany and Sweden will take them all. We can just uh, stay where we are. It is very uh, kind and gracious of them. But uh, so they, they decided to act as transit countries. And you had uh, what you might have heard called the Western Balkans route. So people were happily transiting from Greece through the Balkan countries, Macedonia, Serbia. Then they were going further to Hungary. Hungary was saying, here are the trains, go further up to Austria, to Germany. But at some point, <laughs> well, the member states that were actually uh, welcoming all these refugees said, well, this is not a solution either. <laughs> and you had a kind of trickle-down effect of closing borders, which started by Austria that had a kind of meeting with all the countries in the Western Balkans route, apart from Greece, of course. And then they said, well, we have to close our borders. We can't have all these people even transiting. So one by one, they reinstated border controls, effectively uh, trapping the persons that had not managed to already pass. And we saw that 800,000 had reached Germany and their applications are being examined by that member state. But at some point they said, well, basta now, stop. So they reintroduced border controls. And as you know, we are a border uh, free area within uh, the, the member states that are part of, of Schengen. And so individuals were effectively contained in Greece. So this was the first part of the drama. What happens then? Well, they said our normal uh, Dublin rules would mean that these people have to stay here and have to be processed by Greece. This is completely uh, impossible. It was also declared at EU level. So they started a program of relocation. So what is relocation? You have heard maybe about resettlement. So resettlement is the refugees have found protection in a third country, and by third country, we EU uh, <laughs> persons mean non-EU member states. So they are in Jordan, for example, or they are in Lebanon, and we transfer them orderly, in an orderly manner to the EU. This is refugee resettlement. So what was refugee relocation now? Relocation was this transfer, but intra-EU. So from one member state to another, basically from Greece and Italy to other member states. So they said, we need an exception to our normal Dublin rules and we need to transfer uh, these asylum seekers uh, from uh, these two member states to other member states. There was a numerical cap. So you see uh, the numbers here involved. And there was also a type of asylum seekers that was concerned, those that had a very high recognition rate, so 75% and higher. So these were very specific nationalities concerned. For the rest, they were supposed to be, uh, their applications were supposed to be treated by Italy and Greece. And so what was the new uh, thing that happened for the first time? 
was that actually there were some obligatory quotas. So I told you before that there were some countries that were not touched by asylum uh, seekers uh, or by, by issues of asylum very much. So this all changed because for the first time they said we will have obligatory quotas. Every member state and they had a kind of key according to the GDP uh, and the population. They decided how many uh, they would take out of these numbers that I showed you before, has to take some. And this did not fall well with several member states, some of which contested on procedural uh, grounds, and we will not go into that because you will completely fall asleep, but they said this decision was adopted on the wrong uh, procedural, in the wrong procedural way, so they are trying to annul it on a, on a technicality, but what they're basically saying is we are not going to participate in this new system of obligatory quotas. And this actually, we can see it in the numbers of those relocated, which, uh, so this program started in September 2015, and it's supposed to last for only two years, so until September 2017. And so far, we have, we are on, on the 2nd of March, you're very lucky, you have very fresh data that the Commission released just today. So we have relocated 13,500 almost, and this is 14% of the people that we were supposed to relocate. So really drawing near the expiry of the measure, we have around 15%. And this is due a lot to several member states that are not relocating at all. They are refusing uh, to participate in the program in breach of their obligations. So these are some of the, of the issues. So it is obligatory for every member state to participate. At the beginning, you had also Greece and Italy uh, being a bit reluctant because, in fact, they knew that this was a one-off program and they said, well, okay, these numbers are good, but if people keep coming in with this rhythm, this is not going to help us a lot. So isn't it better if we just uh, wave through the people and, and let them pass for as long as, as they could? instead of like keeping them here and, and trying to uh, relocate them. And there was also no formal matching mechanism. On the side of the asylum seeker, you would be assigned to another member state. Uh, you wouldn't have the possibility to say, I want to go here, I want to go there, or even I want to go to a number of member states. And this also initially created a lot of reluctance on the side of asylum seekers to participate. Uh, in the scheme. So these were uh, some of the problematic elements. But then another uh, brilliant solution uh, came into play and this has been externalization of protection. So what if these uh, asylum seekers never made it to the EU and where were they basically coming from? Uh, well, from Turkey. They were crossing uh, the sea passage from uh, Turkey to Greece. This led to a lot of talks between the EU member states and, and Turkey. And I will not go into all these technicalities, but yesterday we learned uh, from the Court of Justice that in fact it is not the EU uh, that has entered into this agreement but it is the member states in their own capacity, so it is an international uh, law uh, level agreement and not an EU law level agreement. So the Court of Justice can, can say nothing about it, it cannot scrutinize it. So this is what we learned also yesterday. And what basically they agreed was that Turkey had to stop asylum seekers from trying to reach the EU that for those who made it to Greece after this date, which was 18th March last year, they would be returned back to Turkey, and that instead another asylum seeker who was not a queue jumper, who was waiting for their turn to come from Turkey, would be resettled. So a bit a move like this. So stay where you are, and the only way that you will come is in an orderly manner. 
But this, of course, said without really raising credibly the numbers of resettlement, so the numbers of people that can come in an orderly manner from Turkey. And why did Turkey uh, do this? Not out of pure kindness first. Uh, they got a certain amount of money, uh, 3 billion euro. This is the so-called uh, refugee facility, so money to care for uh, the refugees in Turkey. But also, most importantly, uh, they got promises that uh, soon there would be visa liberalization for their, for Turkish nationals to come to the EU. This has been blocked, but for now uh, they are still uh, partaking in their part of the deal. Looking at this solution, what do you think are some of the problematic elements? Well, I mean, in the first slide it said Turkey has 2.9 um, million Syrian or Syrian or just refugees, maybe. Um, so obviously, like compared to any of the EU countries, they're taking on such a big proportion of the problem. Um, so it doesn't seem like a fair kind of deal. Thinking of global sharing, global level sharing. Like, I think I agree that, like, it's also not really sharing responsibility, which is bound to cause problems, like, later. But it's also, like, pr like dehumanizing, in my opinion, that, like, they'd be giving them money, like, to schlep the problem elsewhere. But, like, yeah, yeah like, policy-wise, it's not, I don't think it's going to work out very well for them. It is clearly a quid pro quo, so money and visa liberalization for keeping people there. It also seems to me like trying to postpone the problem, like sort of even further, without, like, without trying to find a solution within the member states and how we can, like how it would be possible to actually allocate people because the problem was kind of much big, I guess so it, was, it was sort of internal conflict is, was in the member states, but now it's like, okay, now it's not that much of a massive, massive problem in our homes. So like, yeah, let's just try to wait and postpone it a little bit. Postpone it until the next election at one or another EU member state <laughs> also. Think of, of that, of the political setting. So ooh, as long as it doesn't blow up on, on my hands, let's win some more months. Politically and internationally, it might create another problem in that Turkey also has a totalitarian leader, mostly. So something like the Syrian civil war, for example, was caused by the Arab Spring. So, which got bogged down. If there is another Turkish spring, so to speak, then there would be a much larger refugee problem than the Syrian one, because Turkey is a much larger country. So amassing refugees in Turkey might also be a bad idea for the EU, because then there will be no buffer state between the EU and the country that's sourcing refugees, that has the refugees. Exactly, thinking in terms also of strategically, in terms of international relations, you have a, a political situation that is already tense, but then you are containing also large numbers of refugees in the same state. All right, yeah, I was going to say this previously, sorry, I was too late. No, no. no. I was going to say that I don't think necessarily the problem lies with the model you pulled out of the EU constitution and how it, how it aims to deal with the problem, but I think the problem lies in the fact that the EU as an international body that's already having to deal with a lot of international issues is, is, a, is in a very vulnerable, vulnerable position to single-handedly deal with such a large-scale humanitarian crisis. I think one thing that the EU is lacking, is lacking is seeking cooperation with, for example, Middle Eastern countries, as we have seen in the video that you pulled out at the start. Because Middle Eastern countries are, are financially well off and they're in position of, of being helpful and this crisis and beneficial to all these countries and refugees fleeing from Syria. And also I feel like, judging from a religious background, these Middle Eastern countries' culture is more, they could better welcome these refugees into the countries because in, in the EU, as, as was the case in Germany, these refugees are putting a lot of social strains on education, on social services, and I feel like the Middle Eastern countries, especially those richer ones, could do a good job helping out the EU in solving this, this wide and complex problem. Of course, there cannot be a regional solution, so not uh, one region on its own 
can say that now I welcome uh, all the world's refugees. So it is a matter of finding a better, let's say, uh, responsibility sharing among the EU level, but also a greater cooperation at the international level. So it is a blockage. So what we see perhaps in Europe is a miniature of what is happening in the world. Because also in the world, we don't have a kind of honest discussion on oh, how then uh, that this is, let's say, a global uh, level issue and how do we share responsibility more rationally at global level. So then you have everyone going on their own and then also the EU thinking as a region, okay, how do we contain people there and other countries, how do we contain people somewhere else instead of actually trying to find a more rational, uh, let's say, solution at, at global level. So. You, you certainly have a point there, and of course the answer would not have been that just the EU on its own single-handedly can, can, welcome, can welcome everyone. So of course it's just a piece of the puzzle and that we should have, like for example, when there was the Indonesian uh, crisis when you had in the 70s and, and the, the 80s with, Europe, with, with America, let's say, leading, you had the comprehensive plan of action. So thousands of persons actually leaving uh, Vietnam and then reaching different regions, including the US, including Europe, so to have a kind of this kind of comprehensive plan. But at this moment, the political situation is also such that sort of traditional allies uh, might not be ready uh, also to welcome refugees or to to participate in this kind of global level sharing. This is also due to the skepticism because I feel that this humanitarian crisis problem is a twofold problem. It involves refugees who are fleeing for their lives, but it also involves people who are fleeing for better opportunities. As you have said, many of these migrants were not actually fleeing from the war, but they were looking into more prosperous economic opportunities. And I feel like the reason a lot of countries are not accepting these refugees is because they are skeptical of their true intentions. Like for example, uh, I read in an article that Denmark was welcoming refugees last summer, and in some part, like a family was broken down. Some part of them were in Denmark and other other European countries, but in Bam in Denmark they were entitled to higher benefits, and so they were calling all their family em members to go to Denmark just because they would squeeze more out of them. And I feel like that's the skepticism is at the heart of this problem more than anything else. Of course, it is also an issue that you have what is called mixed flows, but then you have to look uh, within, let's say, the mixed flows. As I told you, that the refugee definition is very, very specific. You might, in fact, have persons who do not fulfill the refugee definition, but who also cannot be returned on the basis of the principle of, of non refoulement So, of course, it is then an issue of seeing uh, which persons have an entitlement on protection or humanitarian grounds to stay and which not, but then to find also a humane policy, let's say, to deal with the different uh, parts, let's say, of people who are on the move. So this will need also much more flexibility and, and responses, let's say, from us because real life situation doesn't always uh, comply to rigid legal frameworks and so we need responses to, to different uh, situations. So at EU level, I mean, you could have ways of greater sharing. For example, we talked before about financing. So you could say that I, I, we must draw a bigger part of financing on asylum and migration and external border policies from the EU budget. So this would help member states saying, well, we will not be left alone and then uh, have to, you know, sort of single-handedly carry this from our national budget, but we can be helped uh, by the EU budget. So more moving towards a compensation model for your investment in these policies could be one. Then you could have other models uh, where you said, well, we will find a more rational uh, way of to share people, like as you had this first uh, relocation scheme to say that this could be on a more permanent, let's say, basis and sort of rationalized a bit to, to try to at least take into account uh, the choices of the asylum seekers or 
natural links that they have where they would integrate better. So, and it could be a variant, like having some uh, on financing, some on people sharing, uh, some to go more, uh, let's say, also on freedom of movement post-recognition, that it is not so uh, rigid as now. So you could have various solutions, but for now we, we thought of the more, uh, let's say, the preferred solution is externalization. So sort of many of these discussions have halted <laughs> within, within the EU because we have found the optimum of actually externalizing the, the problem. So uh, I have one comment and one question. Uh, I wanted to comment on the point about the Middle East because in the video it was stated that the UAE didn't uh, accept any refugees and I'm from Abu Dhabi campus and uh, there were actually more than 120,000 Syrians relocated to UAE since 2011. They're just labeled as workers and not as refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, and my question is if a member state can choose uh, which refugees they will accept. Because, for example, Slovakia claimed that they will accept only Christian refugees from a legal point of view. So this video is also from 2015, just to, to say, so it doesn't cover what has happened. And of course, yes, it might not account for programs that actually accepted uh, people, but under worker status and not under a, a protected status. So you are right also to, to observe this. For now, formally, uh, member states, when they resettle, they are not allowed to cherry pick, but in practice, there often, often this happens because you have a large number of persons who are in, for example, camps in, in the first countries, as we call them, first countries of asylum. And there they hold interviews. And in fact, they, they, there is a type of selection uh, just because the numbers are so vast and the positions uh, for resettlement are fewer. There is, many countries have a kind of good practice of having a certain percentage of 10 or 15% uh, for extremely vulnerable individuals. So individuals who are ill and, and need extensive treatment that they cannot get in this camp. So you do have also this good uh, best practices if you want. But for the grand majority, yes, you could say that informally, uh, of course, there is no formal policy that they can cherry pick, but just because they can hold interviews, you have a lot of practices where they say, yes, it is the, uh, that they choose uh, on the basis of the level of, of education or they prefer a certain profiles, families with children and not single men. So uh, you do have this uh, happening. And now on a smaller scale, you have it also on relocation. Uh, where, where they say that among those eligible, just because we are still relocating fewer cases, uh, you have the issue of, uh, let's say again, uh, cherry picking. Hi, thank you for the talk. I have two questions. Um, so for the data just released yesterday of the 15% relocation rate, is it um, um, based on um, the, the people, who the refugees, um, or the asylum seekers who have already been granted asylums, or is it um, like a general statistics of all the asylum seekers? So it's a, a close to 14%. So this comes on the basis, as I told you, there was a kind of a ceiling of people to be relocated, and these were the numbers. So they said, we must relocate this uh, amount from Italy and this amount from Greece. And so what has happened is from this desired amount that this decision, because it was an emergency measure, uh, they set sort of arbitrarily, they said this is the number uh, that we want to take. So it is the 14% of this number, but they have not been processed. So they are asylum seekers but they hold the nationality with a very high recognition rates. So they are Syrian asylum seekers, for example. They are, very, they are Eritrean asylum seekers. So they, they hold the nationality of, of countries where you know that even if there has not been processing, there are very high chances that, in fact, they would be 
granted protection. Mm. And this is the number of persons effectively relocated mm. so that already they are in another member state because you have the, pl the pledges. So countries saying, I will relocate this many. This is not what we take into account. Now we, we are talking about those who have actually made it and, mm. and, and they are there. <coughs> And this is based on voluntary participation of the member states, the relocation? This time, no. So this was one of the, of the big changes. It was made on the basis of quotas. So they said everyone has to take some and they fixed quotas that on the basis of GDP and population. And so they said, so from all these, uh, I don't know, random numbers, uh, Germany would need to take 7,000 and Slovakia would need to take 500. So it, it came relative to their capacity. So this was also another interesting thought for the first time that actually uh, the sharing of responsibility has to be relative uh, to the capacity of, of the member state because so far it was geographic, let's say, reasons that had nothing to do with, with actual uh, capacity measured in one or another indicator. Uh, then we can discuss which is the best indicator and, and this or that or this and that. But there was never even a thinking that there needs to be a kind of relative sharing on the basis of, of capacity. It was uh, based, in fact, on a, on a kind of border control mentality that, well, these uh, individuals should never have reached. So the EU territory, so the responsible member states are the ones at the borders that were supposed to guard the borders if, if you scratch a bit behind the legislation. Sorry, I just have one last question. Yes. So, uh, for the you said the EU Turkey deal is uh, internationally is an international law. As does it mean that the EU has no mandate to um, do anything about it? And what does it mean in practice? What's uh, does it have any mm -hmm. effect on the crisis? It's even more. <laughs> complicated, so at, uh, at EU level, so how the EU works, because we have several fields, you have this notion of competence. Uh, so the EU has competence to act in some fields, and this we have in our treaties. So for example, in asylum, there is a competence for the EU to act and in, to legislate. In other areas, such as education, uh, the EU does not have the competence to act. So there are some areas where only the member states may act, some, mem some areas where you share competence, and this is asylum and migration. So the EU and the member states share the competence. So once the EU has legislated something, you have to follow the EU legislation, and the part that has not been legislated remains at national level. I hope I'm, I'm being understood. And you have some very specific policies that are at the exclusive hands of the EU level. This is, for example, competition law. But this is the exception. So asylum and migration are areas of shared competence. And when you have shared competence, also externally, the EU could act or you could have the member states acting. Mm. So here it is a kind of... <laughs> Fictitious, but what actually was said that it was not the EU that acted, it was the member states in their capacity as individual uh, countries that gathered all together. So it was the heads of states that actually are, were the heads of states of the EU that made this agreement with Turkey. So what the court said is when it comes to the member states agreeing something outside our EU cooperation at international level, I cannot intervene. I cannot then further examine. The member states remain free <coughs> actors to the extent of what is not in the competence yet of the EU to do what they want. And so it, it said that, well, I as a court do not have jurisdiction to look into this because in fact it doesn't fall under EU law. Uh, so this is left at, at, the, of, at the international uh, realm or at uh, the human rights protection realm, if you will, by, by the Strasbourg court. So uh, previously mentioned, like, once an application is denied, it's validated, like, EU-wide. 
Mm -hmm. But I've read this article that there's like strong inconsistency of the results of the application. Like uh, one application can have like different results in different asylums in Italy or different asylums in like EU countries. So what really concerns me is like to think that maybe this applicant is just like unlucky to have applied in an area that doesn't have a high like successful rate, but they could have been like uh, granted the permission to stay at other places, but they cannot like reapply, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, you are very right. This is one of the big problems. Uh, people have written about this and they have called it the asylum lottery. And uh, civil society organizations had made a nice slide where for the same population, so Afghan uh, asylum seekers, you had recognition rates varying from uh, 0.5 to 90%. So of course, if you were an Afghan asylum seeker, you had every interest to be in the countries that did their process differently and where you would be in fact granted protection than to go in the member state that ha had the recognition rate of 0 0.5. Thinking that uh, all the bad cases cannot have congested in one member state while all the valid cases uh, magically uh, found themselves in another. So this was an issue and is an issue and this is what they are trying to combat. They are trying to have better standards at processing so that you could have a kind of EU-wide uh, standard average that is more rational than zero and, and 90 percent. But there is still a lot of work. So this is one of the thoughts that they are having. What could we do more bottom-up to sort of harmonize our practices and have equal standards, but for the moment it is more an aspiration than a reality. So of course asylum seekers think where they, they, they would be in order for their claim to be assessed fairly. And of course they don't want to be in a country where there are ineffective asylum procedures. I've been focusing on the immigration from Yemen to Norway specifically. It was a little convoluted and backwards. And I was wondering because there was a contrast, a very sharp contrast between the efficiency from Yemenese people immigrating to Norway, or emigrating mm -hmm. to Norway, and then to say Sweden, where Sweden had a much, had much better results in terms of uh, treatment and, and um, granted asylums once they got there in Norway by a rather large margin. And I'm wondering, since um, Norway and Sweden are both pretty well-off countries, why, is, why there is such a stark difference between the two? It's not always, I mean, the difference in processing doesn't always have to do with resources. So we need not only think about uh, let's say uh, the fact that uh, processing is not happening because there are very few decision makers or this is a reality in some member states. In others it could be different cultures in, in processing or a standard of country of origin information or also policy decisions, for example, whether to be strict or less strict. So this is why it is so difficult to harmonize practices because it is not only, oh, if we only poured uh, more money, everything uh, would be fine and your example actually highlights this. So it could mean uh, administrative practices uh, decisions that are that are taken in the US there was a very interesting study where they even found that between different let's say uh, within the same organization also between it, 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 it also lay on the individual decision makers that you had different cultural perceptions for example so it can be extremely tricky uh, to try to, to harmonize this even within the same country so then I will just, uh, I've le left you here with some also useful links for your research with uh, statistics and fact sheets about uh, the EU agenda on migration that uh, you can use in your uh, studies. So 
Thank you very much for your attention and for your participation for our discussions.